this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of, of August 13th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning now from 620 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcasts of our discussions following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our look at whether, as some claim, Alaska has settled into a new economic normal. Second, as the timetable for Alaska LNG slips away, what remains of Governor Walker's vision for a second term? And third, our final pre-primary wrap-up of the issues that we think are important as voters go to the polls next week. And now, let's join Michael. I'm ready to go, and now we're getting into it with my friend Brad Keithley who is with Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. We even have his own little secret intro. Here's what that sounds like. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Yep. The economic forecast, uh, he sticks his finger in the air and says, tut, tut, looks like rain, and uh, tells us all about it. Good morning, Brad. How are you doing this morning? Can you hear me? Oh, let's do that right there. Can you hear on me, Brad? The, on the, the, the new show, and, and, well, and, uh, and, and great, great to be talking to Homer. Homer. Well, thank you so much for coming on board. I had to push the right button there. Thanks for coming in and joining us. Uh, as always, you are, it seems like, a lot of times the voice of reason when it comes to a lot of these budgetary issues and discussions. Uh, and for those that ha are not familiar with Brad, again, former oil and gas consultant and attorney who's since retired and has formed Alaskans for a sustainable budget because he has a passion to try and see the state live within its means and do the best that it possibly can for its citizenry. And that seems to be something that's sorely lacking out there, right, Brad? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a challenge. I mean, we, we, we live in the moment. I don't think we think a lot about what the consequences of our spending decisions have been. You were talking earlier about, you know, where we've been headed since 2008, really intensely got going there, fired up all of the spending engines in 2000, 2010, 2011, 2012, uh, and really haven't backed off those engines yet. And, and we haven't, at the time that we were doing that, uh, we didn't look at the consequences of where that might leave us. Um, and, and now we've, we're suffering some of that. And frankly, we're not yet focusing on the consequences of where we're headed. You and I have talked on the show about what, what, we, what the outlook is for the 2020s if we keep going in the direction we're going. And it's not good. And, uh, and so, yeah, we try to talk about those things uh, on the show and try to point out areas where we can do better in Alaska and, and make both the current, our current lives and our future lives, which are just as important, uh, future generations uh, uh, better. Be at that point of you know equilibrium, and uh, you have a you got your top three, and we're going to start off with Tim Bradner and his piece in the uh, in the ADN. Yeah, yeah so, so Tim, Tim Bradner, Bradner who's, who's a longtime long columnist, a longtime long observer of Alaska's oil and gas and fiscal uh, uh, issues. issues. Wrote a piece in the ADN, and and the the, um, the the headline of the piece is "Life's Not All Bad as Alaska Economy Finds a New Normal." And the argument of the piece, the thesis of the piece, is we've sort of settled into this new normal. We've got some oil and gas developments going on. We have some mining developments going on. Good news yesterday on the Donlin Gold Mine uh, out west, 
and Tim sort of makes the argument that, well, we're okay, and we've sort of settled into this life, uh, into this new normal, and Alaska will be fine. I take exception to that. I, I don't think that, 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 we've, that we've settled at a new – if this is the new normal, I don't think it's the new normal that, uh, that is going to do us the best good to Alaska and Alaskans uh, the best good going forward. A big reason for that is, is this new normal that we've settled at uh, is built in large part on a significant PFD cut. You and I talked on the show last week about what the size of the PFD would be if it hadn't been cut by the legislature. We would have a $3,000 PFD uh, coming up this fall, given the size of the earnings uh, that, uh, that the Permanent Fund Corporation generated this past year, averaging that back, back, back over the last five years, looking, looking at the number of recipients, we would have a $3,000 PFD coming up. The legislature, in its infinite wisdom, however, only voted for a $1,600 PFD. They violated the state statute that governs how the PFD is supposed to be calculated. They, they essentially overrode that and set the PFD at 1600 that $1,400 shortfall, if you put that in the hands of Alaskans, um, it has a huge bang for the buck. It, it, it has the largest multiplier effect of any state spending, uh, both in terms of jobs and income. So if, we are, if we've reset the new normal uh, based upon significant PFD cuts, we, we've set a much lower bar, a much lower standard of living for Alaskans going forward than where we could be. If we lived up to the statutes and to Governor Hammond's vision and put the full PFD, as Governor Hammond envisioned it, in Alaskans' hands, we have, we have lowered Alaskans' future um, uh, if, this is, if this is the new normal. Well, and I think we've also done something else. We've artificially, we've we've allowed, created an artificial level of government spending because by taking that, they've created this artificial, unsustainable level of government spending because you can't keep taking from the people. I mean, that that's a finite pool. I mean, yeah, they've taken half the dividend now or a third or, two, you know, whatever it is, and then it's two thirds, and then maybe it's just the whole thing. There's a finite pool of money discounting the whole impact on the private economy and everything else. Just, I mean, there's only so much of it. And you cannot continue to artificially bolster the the, the, the level of government spending and expect that there's, A, not going to be any consequences, and B, that there won't be an end to it. Because then it'll be some kind of appetite for a tax or multiple taxes or user fees. or and it, but, but eventually you run out of opium, other people's money, OPM. You eventually run out of that, and then, and then where are you left? Yeah, exactly right. I, and, and we are taxing. I mean, the PFD cut is a tax. PFDs, permanent fund dividends in, in, in the Alaska economy are income, is income to individual Alaskans. Uh, it, is, it is, as Governor Hammond envisioned it, it's the implementation of the constitutional provision that says that the natural resources are to be used for the maximum benefit of the people. Um, the maximum benefit in Governor Hammond's view and in the view of most economists is to get that is to get a significant share of that money in the hands of Alaskan citizens and let them make the decisions about how it's spent. And that has the biggest bang for the buck uh, in the overall uh, Alaska economy. So we, we do have a tax and, and we're taxing the private economy in a huge way right now. We're taking, you know, the, the percentage right now is we're taking 45 percent of the PFD, 45 percent of this year's PFD will be retained by government as a tax, and only 55 percent of the PFD that otherwise uh, would be would be due under the statute and due under Gov Governor Hammond's vision, only 55 percent of that PFD is going out to the public. So you, we are, I mean, we we are engaged in tax right now. Those who voted for it. Peter Machecki, um, uh, uh, Kevin Meyer, uh, those those legislators that that voted for it voted for a tax on the Alaska private sector to move that money over to government to, as you say, uh, help support bloated government spending. I mean, there are ways we can reduce government spending. We can go through that uh, at, at, at infinitum at some point uh, down the road. But it's uh, it, we we have we have taxed the private economy. Uh, we, we, have, we have taxed it in a way that has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy uh, and is by far the costliest to Alaska families.
From uh, We're talking with Brad Keithley here from Alaskans for a sustainable budget. Uh, he gives us his weekly top three. We're still on the number one here. There's one more thing I want to touch on before we let this one go. Brad, again, in the, uh, in the article from Tim Bradner uh, in the ADN, uh, I had to chuckle because he's in here quoting Bill Pop, CEO of AEDC, the Anchorage Economic Development Corp., which really, in a lot of ways, seems to be a propaganda arm of government spending and other things. They're talking about, you know, here's what happened, a recession loss. We shed thousands of jobs. We shed 5,000 oil jobs, which I totally buy. But then they go, add to that 3,000 state jobs lost since 2005, and they were shed because oil revenues plummeted. And yet I talked to certain <laughs> legislators who say, 3,000 jobs? What are you talking? And Pop has used this number several times. And I'm like, they was like, where's the 3,000 job losses? I mean, have you sussed that out a little bit? Because I didn't see the state cutting 3,000 jobs. Well, well they, they, include, they, they include the university system. system. And the, the university, university at Fairbanks and to some degree the University of Anchorage uh, have, have had job losses. losses. And, and once you add, add those in... in uh, plus some some positions that otherwise were unoccupied uh, that they that they cut. Uh, you you can get upwards of that number. But the important point part of the the important thing about that particular point, Michael, is is yes we've we've cut three thousand jobs or we've only cut three thousand jobs, but we have taken money out of the private sector through PFD cuts to support continued spending. So yes, government employees are better off. And yes, those businesses that depend on government, government-related uh, businesses, are better off. But what we've done that, but how we've done, we've done that is at the expense of the overall Alaska economy and Alaskan citizens. It has ICER, the University of Alaska Anchorage's Institute for Social and Economic Research, the best unbiased, nonpartisan economic analysis group uh, covering Alaska. They, they, they have said that cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, is by far the costliest step that you can take in terms of Alaska families, costs, the, the tax step that costs Alaska families the most. So we've cut some of government, uh, but we've sustained a heck of a lot more than we can afford, and we've done it by transferring money out of the private sector having the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, by far the costliest to Alaska families, to make some government officials, some government employees, and some government contractors better off. It's, we, 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 we've helped out one sector, but at the expense of the overall. And that's been, that's been the problem that Alaska has had for several years now. We've, we, we, we've focused, people in Juneau have focused on government only, how government uh, makes out in the economy. They haven't focused on the overall economy, and that's frankly part of the reason we are where we are. We've had the recession we've had. They've not been focusing on the overall economy. Well, hey, Brad, this is the new normal. You just need to get used to it. Come on, get get with the program. Join the bandwagon. <laughs> that's what's happening. Uh, Brad Keithley's our guest. Again, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. We're down to less than uh, three minutes here or so. Uh, Brad, I do want to kick things off, though, on your number two, and then we'll spread across the break and come back and finish up. So your number two of your top three this morning has to do with the governor. Yeah, so here's here's one of the problems we had in 2014. As we were having the election campaign of 2014, oil prices were sliding down. They had started at over $100 at the beginning of that campaign. They were at $70, I think, by the by election day, and then they slid on down into the 30s after the election. During the campaign of 2014, nobody was taking into account what was going on. I recall being at one of the forums uh, in the fall of 2014, and somebody asked the question, what's the most important issue we're not talking about right now? And at that point, I said, it's the falling oil price, because that's going to have a huge impact on us going forward. But all the campaign was conducted around people assuming that oil was going to continue to be $100 and above, so that wasn't going to be an issue. They could worry about other things. I think there are issues, I think there are things like that going on during this campaign that we're not talking about yet that we should be talking about during the campaign. We ought to be looking forward what's going to happen between 2018 and 2022 when this governor serves his term. Not what, not what we've done between 2014 and 2018. What are the issues going forward? And I don't think the governor comes out, Governor Walker comes out well on these issues when we talk about that. 
Our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. I think uh, this is the thing right now we're just talking about, again, Bill Walker, his decisions and everything else. There look to me, and we can get into this on the other side, uh, I look at this and see that he had one goal. Again, I supported Bill Walker when he ran for governor initially. Uh, I think that we've had some issues with that. He obviously has changed from what I was looking for uh, when it was all said and done. But I'm telling you right now, I think that there was a reason for it. We'll get back into that with Brad Keithley's number two on the other side right here. You're listening to The Michael Duke Show. You're on for Common Sense Radio on KPEN 101.7 and KGTL AM 620 and FM 100.1. Back with more right after these messages. All right, folks, we're continuing here with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. we got about three minutes here, Brad. I'd love for you to go ahead and just kind of branch out on your thoughts here before we jump back into it with the radio audience. Again, here's, here's, my, here's, my, here's my thing with Governor Walker. I think he was so focused, so hyper-focused on getting the gas line no matter what. That has become, that was his whole drive going in. It was one of the things I admired about him as a candidate and in talking to him ahead of time. And I think he essentially, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, jettisoned common sense and reason on a lot of these fiscal issues with that one main goal of doing nothing but making sure that he gets that pipeline. Damn all the other finances. He's got to make something look good enough to be able to make that pipeline go through. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Michael, I, I think that's correct. And and here here's the thing that, that we can talk about when we come back on, on the air. I think the pipeline, I think the LNG project's going away. It's not going away for for economics. It's the economics really haven't changed underneath it. China is the big change. The trade war we're having with China and and that beginning to appear like it's settling into a long term deal. The market for LNG um, is China. That's, that's, I mean, in the Pacific Rim, that's what the market is. Um, and, and Governor Walker and others deserve a lot of credit for, for developing that relationship with China and, and trending to look uh, toward what looked like to be a very good, solid arrangement with China, with China putting money in the ground here uh, in Alaska so that they didn't, you know, they weren't tempted to go someplace else after uh, after the deal started, they'd have money in the ground. They would go. They would have to go through with the deal, or they, the incentives would be to go through with the deal. But that's changing. The trade war, the trade war between the U.S. and China is changing that dynamic. It's pushing LNG off. So, so that's no longer. I don't think that is what's what we focus on in the next four years. And without that, I'm not sure what Governor Walker's really really thinking about. You go to his website. There's nothing on there about. What am I going to do the next four years? And if what he says in response to that question is, I'm going to do the same thing I've done the last four years, that's bad. I mean, as we just talked about, cutting the PFD, <laughs> taking money out of the private sector is bad. So if we don't have something different that he's going to land uh, in the next four years, if we're going to stay in sort of status quo on LNG for the next four years, uh, what is his plan? Where are we headed? Brad Keithley is our guest right now. He is with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. That's an organization dedicated to making sure that we got something in the next 25 or 30 years here in the state of Alaska without having to tax people into oblivion and, uh, you know, some kind of watchdog that holds government accountable. Before we went to break, we were talking a little bit about the governor's plan. And, uh, of course, the cornerstone of his entire campaign, Brad, was oil and gas, but specifically the All-Alaska Gas Pipeline. And I think he became so focused on that, that to the exclusion of all else, he was, come hell or high water, he was going to make sure that the finances, financials in the state look good for that. If he had to pay for it out of the state coffers, they were going to do it. He literally, to the exclusion of all else, has focused on that. And I think that has been to the detriment of the overall economy because it just he became obsessed with it. And I think that's where this has led him. But you're saying that might not be any help to him now, right? Well, exactly right. As I said, as I said before the break, in the 2014 campaign, the elephant in the room that nobody talked about was was falling oil prices and what that would do uh, to Alaska. I think the elephant in the room as we come into as we come into this campaign, as things clarify after the primary, 
Governor Walker is going to talk about a bright future for Alaska based upon LNG, and that's going to be the, the focus um, of his campaign. The problem with that is I think LNG is falling away, for, for, for at least for a period of time and possibly for a long time. The reason it's falling away is because of the trade war we're having with China. China is, is – uh, Governor Walker needs to be commended for the steps he took in trying to link up to the China market. The China market is the market for Alaska LNG. It is – I mean, China is the growing LNG consumer. That is the place our LNG fits best. And, and maybe the only place it fits. And and we were on track to do that. But the trade war, I think, has broken things. I, China uh, is not going to be investing significant sums uh, in the U.S. I had a post up on my on the Facebook page, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, a couple of days ago that talks about the drop in inbound investment from, from China as a result of the trade war. It's a huge drop. And China is not going to be investing in the Alaska LNG project. Frankly, as long as the trade war is going on, and probably for a period of time after that, uh, so that they can be sure that uh, that that things are things are restored to a normal uh, situation, and where China can invest without without concern about you know its money being left stranded. That's the change that I think nobody's talking about yet in the 2018 campaign, and I think that changes everything. If you take that out of Governor Walker's campaign, then what's his vision for the next four years? And if the vision for the next four years is I'm going to do the same thing I've done the last four years, that's not good from, from the standpoint, standpoint of the overall Alaska economy and individual Alaskans. So, so we need to be talking about, just like in 2014, we should have been talking about what, what's going to be the situation that Alaska faces from 2014 to 2018 if the oil price drop that we were seeing in 2014 uh, continues that was that's that should have been the focus of the 2014 campaign. It wasn't. The focus of the 2018 campaign, from a from an economic standpoint, should be what happens if LNG isn't going to occur. What do we do instead? And that issue that issue, I don't I don't think Governor Walker is prepared to discuss that issue. Right. We can't continue to do the same thing and expect any different results. I mean, this is the kind of the whole discussion on the charter of changes. The first change is change the players. Because if you just keep sending the same group of people back down there with the same habits, the same thought processes, the same point of view, we're going to get more of the same. And we can't deal with more of the same. We're in the longest running recession in state history. Highest unemployment, highest crime, highest health care costs. We could go down the list of all the number ones that we shouldn't be number one in. And we just cannot keep doing the same thing over and over. And as you point out, the governor doesn't even have on his website, there's no reason to vote for him. It's like there's no issue. It's like, hi, donate. It's about me. That's it. I mean, there's just really no, where's the, why? Why would we do it? Yeah, websites used to be. I mean, political websites always were. This is this is my issue statement. This is my vision. This is where I'm going to go uh, in the next four years if you elect me. You go to Mark Begich's website. He's got it. You and I have talked about it. We don't agree with everything that's on that website, but at least he's got some vision. You go to Mike Dunleavy's. He's got some vision. Me Treadwell's got some vision. Governor Walker's website is sort of like this blank page. I mean, there's some pretty pictures on it, and you can go to videos. But but there's not a here's what I want to do from 2018 to 2022. And the one thing we know he wants to talk about is LNG. You take that away and there's just I mean, where does Walker where does he want to take us in the next four years? There's not a vision statement of where we're going in the next four years if LNG doesn't work. And that's the, that's the point I'm trying to make. Just like 2014, when everybody said, well, this is how we're going to divide up this hundred dollar oil. These are our plans for hundred dollar oil. That the elephant in the room was we weren't going to have hundred dollar oil. Governor Walker sort of talking about this is this is my plan if we do LNG. Well, because of the trade dispute with China, we're not going to have LNG anytime in the near future. So tell let, let's get that elephant out in the room and let's talk about it. And now tell us with that el with that taken away, tell us what your vision is for the next four years. If it is just doing the same thing that we've done the last four years, that's not a reason to vote for Governor Walker. There, there, other, the, the two other candidates are going to have much better reasons. 
Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget, is our guest here on the Michael Duke Show. We appreciate you uh, coming in and listening this morning, getting these deeper discussions. That was number two of Brad Keithley's weekly top three. Brad, let's move on to item number three on the agenda here. So, so item number, number three, three is we're coming to the end of the primary period. The primary is next Tuesday. Uh, what, have we learned, what, what have we learned about candidates? What are the issues we ought to be focusing on? Uh, and the things, the things that I've sort of brought things down to over the course of the primary and sort of said, this is how I'm going to judge candidates, this is how I'm judging, you know, the fiscal responsibility of candidates is based on three things. One is, what's your budget number? Uh, if your budget number is $4 billion or higher, your operating budget, uh, operating budget number is $4 billion or higher, what you're telling me is you're going to tax Alaskans. You're going to tax them either in terms of PFD cuts or you're going to tax them in such other in, in some other way. But if you're planning on spending above that amount, for, above four billion dollars, uh, then then what you're really saying is I'm going to tax you because we're going to need the revenues. We're going to need new revenues in some fashion to deal with that. So I'm listening for candidates that are talking about budgets in the range of 3.75 billion dollars, 3.8 billion dollars. That's sustainable on a long-term basis without, without significant new revenues uh, of some sort, either PFD cuts uh, or taxes. And that's, that's issue number one. Issue number two is where you stand on the PFD. If, if you say, well, I think the PFD is just about right where it is now, about $1,600, then, then that's a problem because what you're essentially saying is I'm good with transferring, having a tax on the PFD and transferring a huge chunk of money out of the private sector where it does the most good, has the biggest bang for the buck, transferring a chunk of money out of the private sector, out of the hands of Alaskan citizens, into Alaska government. You, the, a candidate who says, I think we're just about right where we are on the PFD now, is essentially saying, I value government over the private sector. I value money in the hands of government as being more important than, hands, than money in the hands of private individuals. Um, and, and I think that's a problem. And the third issue that I'm, that, that I'm looking at for candidates to talk about is kicking costs down the road. Whether a candidate is saying, yeah, we owe these costs, but let's push them off on future generations. We've done that in a couple of ways. PERS and TERS, the retirement systems, are, are built on pushing a bunch of costs down to the down to Alaskans in the 2020s and 2030s and 2040s. We're underpaying what we should be paying for PERS and TERS now and pushing those costs off on the 2020s and 2030s, making their lives, making Alaskans in the 2020s and 2030s, their lives worse off in order so, so ours can be better. And there was another bill this last legislature, HB 331, that dealt with some oil tax credits that did the same thing, that pushed a bunch of costs that we ought to be paying now that Alaskans currently ought to be ought to be fessing up to, pushing those costs uh, off to the 2020s and uh, and 2030s, saying you know we're just going to hide what we're doing, shove those costs down the road, and and that's how we've gotten into this situation already, and it's just making it worse in the 2020s and 2030s uh, to be shoving, shoving those costs down. down. So, so those are the three fiscal issues that that as as we've gone through this primary season, I've really centered on and I've used to evaluate candidates and, uh, and, and sort of make some judgments about which candidates are better, uh, better than others. Those three issues have been, the, have been the ones that have emerged to me as being the most important. And, and all three of those, again, a, an excellent yardstick. Sandy in the chat room here on Facebook is asking, again, who, you know, which candidates do you support and everything else. This is the yardstick you're using, and then you have the actual uh, – you actually have your recommendations up. I know they're out on your Facebook page. I've shared them on my website at, and, and on my Facebook page at facebook.com slash Michael Duke Show. These are all great things. Again, Brad Keithley. Uh, Alaskans for a sustainable budget. Brad, I got about sixty seconds here. We're again slaves to the clock. Bla Brad and I were, uh, Brad and I were, uh, uh, we were used to basically running amok here and just talking as long as we want. So we're both kind of getting uh, uh, hunkered down here. Brad, about forty-five seconds or so to uh, summate and uh, give us uh, any of your final thoughts here. When you evaluate candidates next week in voting on the primary, when you evaluate candidates, look at their long-term vision, not just what they're saying they're going to do for you today, 
but look at their long-term vision, whether they have a long-term perspective on Alaska's future. We got into our current situation by having politicians that only looked at the day, only looked at how much money they could funnel out during the day, as opposed to looking five years down the road. We need to be looking at candidates this, this election cycle who are looking down the road who are taking into account things like no LNG uh, and other things and voting for candidates who have that long-term vision. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming in and joining us again. Good to talk with you. Uh, thank you, Brad, for sticking with us here uh, through the top of the hour break. Uh, I will give you a couple minutes if you want to summate with a Facebook crowd here uh, because the Facebook crowd are special people. They get they get more access than some of the radio folks. And we're going to be doing more of this fun stuff, by the way, uh, for Common Sense Core members. We'll be doing that as well. Uh, Brad, uh, go ahead. We'll let you. Uh, if there was anything that we missed that we really need to know, people can come back to it. Go ahead. No, I think I, I think I got it prioritized fairly well. The, the only, only thing, thing I, I would say is I do have some recommendations on individual candidates. You can find them both on, on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page, but also uh, as the lead story on my personal blog, uh, I've I've not got – I've done uh, recommendations for all of the races that have incumbents, and some of the races that don't have uh, a few of the races that don't have incumbents. Frankly, I'm still working through the races where there are no incumbents, like the two Eagle River uh, House districts. There, you're judging people based upon what they've got on their Facebook sites and what they've said during the uh, campaign. Uh, and actually, that's you know, we, we've had a history of that of judging, you know candidates of what they say during a race and then they turn around and do something else. So I'm trying to put a little bit more depth to that. One of the things I'm proud of is on these on these recommendations, I've got the reason for the recommendation uh, in a column out to the side of the candidate uh, that we're supporting. Right. Uh, and I and I and I put some thought into that. So tried tried to tried to tie that back to fiscal issues. Yeah, well and I hope you'd have you have you uh, updated it since uh, yesterday? That's all I want to know. With some of the recommendations out there in some of the races, with <laughs> if you watch been watching the news, is what I'm asking uh, with the, some of these Republican candidates who are now in the headlines. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I'm not sure which one you're talking about because a lot of them have been in the headlines. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. I was thinking specifically about Hallett. Uh, on the whole uh, the whole food stamp thing yeah. and all that kind of craziness. I mean, I don't, I haven't had a chance to discuss it with her yet. She she tried to come on the program yesterday. She wanted to. She approached me, and then I haven't been able to. Uh, she hasn't responded when I, I sent her something back, so I don't know if she's in hunger down mode or what, but I would like an explanation. Yeah, and, and that, that race is difficult. I mean, I, I'm, I am not a fan of Chris Birch. Chris Birch has been part of the problem. He is not part of the solution. Chris, Chris Birch went on record this last legislative session and said he's prepared to take the PFD down to zero before he looks at any other form uh, of new revenue. So he's prepared to drain out the private economy, the thing that has the biggest bang for the buck in the private economy, to zero before he's prepared to do anything else. Um, and, I, and, and Chris Birch is not the kind of person that we need in the Senate. So I've had a lot of hope for Becca in that race. Uh, it is concerning to see those headlines. Uh, but again, you have to be, you have to be a little wary of headlines that come out in the last week, uh, before the voting. I hope you're able to catch up with her. I hope you're able to talk through it, uh, with her. Uh, but right now I haven't changed that recommendation, uh, simply because I want to give her the benefit of the doubt and simply because Chris Birch is such a bad candidate, uh, such a bad person to put, uh, uh, in the Alaska state Senate. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to get both sides of the story, and it's been very uh, tough right now. I mean, again, from the outside looking in, it looks it looks bad, um, but without really being able to get the full story, um, I mean, I can't make a judgment call on it per se. Uh, I could jump to conclusions, uh, but let's let's see if we can get both sides of it. I've looked at the court documents, and it's pretty damning. So 
we'll 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 see how it goes. Hopefully, she gets back in touch with us, and we can bring her back on the show to discuss it. Uh, but again, you could see all of these recommendations uh, for Brad's, uh, you know, for the candidates that Brad has vetted and taken a look at, and it's very thought. You look at the the spreadsheet; it's it's very thorough. And again, Brad gives a reasoning for each and every recommendation and stuff like that. Uh, Brad, I appreciate all the work you put into that. I shared it uh, almost immediately when it popped up because you and I are in agreement. I think I said I don't always agree 100 percent with Brad, but the 99th percentile is not bad. So uh, we're doing good on that. Uh, Brad, Brad Keithley, uh, again, Alaska's for sustainable budget. BGKeithley.com is his blog, and you can uh, find all his thoughts and musings over there. Final thoughts, Brad, here. We're about uh, two minutes out from the uh, break. Uh, so your final thoughts, and we'll let you go. Well, thank you, Michael. And again, thank you for uh, uh, thank you for uh, letting me come on the show. It's it's uh, it's a great opportunity to have this discussion. The chat room, I think, has been a great thing uh, on Facebook Live. I'm glad to see that you're continuing that. I go back and read it after the show. Frankly, I'm, I'm not. I can't. I, I can't divide my attention enough to follow it while I'm on. But I do you go, go back, back and read it after the show and sort of catch up with the thoughts people have and take those take those into consideration. So, doing a great job. Thank you so much for. Uh, for the opportunity and uh, and great to have you uh, back on terrestrial radar or terrestrial radar terrestrial radio uh, and uh, and spreading through the state. Well, I appreciate that, Brad. Thanks very much. I mean, come on, can't you multitask? You can do that. You can read the comments and talk at the same time. You got to. <laughs> my brain hurts, Brad. My brain hurts. It's like you know all the different windows, and I only have one computer screen today, so it's like all the windows are out there. It's fun stuff. Brad Keithley, <laughs> Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad, as always, good to talk with you. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on board. We will talk with you next week on Election Day. That'll be fun stuff. Thanks for coming in. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.